Hello. Hi, Victoria. John boy. Hi. Jen, Terry, Manny, Gilbert, Ali, Carolina, Carolyn, Orlando, E. Willock. Good morning, Gilbert. Hello. Good morning, Carolyn. Hi. Hey, Jenna, down there in Miami. I'm getting ready to vacation in the Florida Keys. We're going to fly into Miami and then drive down to Key West. Hi. Good morning. Hey, David. Hello, musical. Brenda. Pastor 2019. All right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Susie in Ohio. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get started in Nashville. All right, just in case you're new to my ministry, my name is Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books. Good morning, Larry. Warsaw. All my books are available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle. I'm currently working on re-releasing all seven of my books in hardcover. Hopefully I can have that done before the end of the year. We will see at the time of me recording this. Today is July 4th, 2022. So I'm going to talk about freedom today. Um, but if you, if you want to check out my books, they're available on Amazon. If you've read any of my books, please go back and leave me a review. I would greatly appreciate that. I also have a podcast. Hi, 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 hi. The name of my podcast is called Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. Be sure to check it out. It is on all of your favorite podcast podcasting apps or podcast apps, however you want to say that. Oh, uh, what else? I'm on YouTube. I've been on YouTube a couple years now, but I didn't post anything until March, I think, of this year. So when I started doing these walk talks, they began to build up and build up, and I had close to 100, and I had a lot of requests to put these on YouTube so people can watch them there. So I did that, so I went back and I put all of these walk talks on YouTube. So check them out if you get some time. Good morning. Good if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. I greatly appreciate that. What else? What else? Uh, I'm not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. I actually get a lot of attacks from people who think I'm a pastor. And the reason why is this pastor mentality is rampant on planet Earth, where there's one individual who supposedly, air quotes, has power above other people. But if we go back to the Bible and we find the word pastor in the New Testament, we only see it one time. It's in the book of Ephesians, and it's in Ephesians chapter 4. It's listed as a spiritual gift. So we have to change our mind about what the word pastor means in Scripture. In Scripture, it is not one person in charge of a church building who's up on stage telling everybody what to do. That's completely absent. That is completely absent from all biblical text. It's not there. So this began back in the first century, um, close to the second century, by Igne Ignatius of Antioch. He took this word, pastor, created a position, and then started putting people in charge named pastor. And it's just kind of gone <laughs> to the wayside from there. Everybody has began to, at that time, be start it to believe that this individual person was in charge, but that's not in the Bible. And of course the Bible wasn't canonized yet, but they took that word from that letter and then they began to apply this to people. But I'm not a pastor. I'm a regular person just like you. And we don't need to attack people who have that title at a church. We just need to understand that's not in the Bible. When we see the word pastor, we don't see any person who is in charge. We see no list of qualifications. We see no list of authority. It's not there. So I'm not a pastor. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like you, you know, and people who have that quote pastoral position in church buildings, don't disrespect them, love them, respect them. Um, there's a lot of pastors who they have really good intentions and they teach the new covenant. There are a lot of pastors who have really good intentions and they just don't understand the new covenant. We don't need to attack them. We always want to find commonality. We always want to find ways to build bridges. 
sometimes they ain't trying to hear that and they don't want any commonality with you they don't want a bridge built with you if that's the case you know make every effort to live at peace with everybody but if that's not a possibility move along okay uh do, 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 do. what else oh i don't know everything <laughs> i put that in my introduction so i can ease your mind when you watch my walk talks when you listen to my walk talks you don't have to think i gotta go to matt for every single answer there are some ministries set up on that and even i was involved with that for a while and i started to look to an individual person for every single answer what is that <laughs> that's a cult not that that was a cult but it has very cult like uh, operations where it's one individual who knows everything and we got to go to that individual we got to run every question by them you even have to mimic how they act you have to mimic how they talk and if you don't act like this individual or you don't repeat the same thing go oh, you know even in the new covenant camp we see it it's <laughs> they even have bodyguards and gatekeepers who will get on to you that's happened to me so I always want you to know, I don't know everything. I don't have to know everything. <laughs> I just have to know Christ and Christ crucified, okay? So I'm learning and growing just like you. The two things I will never change my mind on is you're completely forgiven, you're completely righteous. Those are things that come from Christ alone through his cross, through his resurrection. That's what I'm gonna talk about mostly in my ministry. Okay, so if you want to contact me, I always welcome your interaction. You can always get a hold of me via my website. Just go over to the contact page. I'll be glad to interact with you there. Now, if you have attempted to contact me via my website and I haven't responded, it's because for some reason your message is not getting to me or it's going to spam. I'm not ignoring you. I don't ignore anybody. So try reaching out to me again. If I haven't responded, um, I always try to keep a, an eye on my spam filter as well. All right. So let's go ahead and get to today's walk talk three facts about our Christian freedom. Okay, this is going to be a fun one. I so enjoy talking about our freedom. It's one of my most favorite things to talk about because our modern church talks about the opposite. <laughs> All these things that you're a slave to or that you got to stop or that, you know, whatever causes you to be whatever which causes you to be in bondage and then you got to do this go there continue to do this continue to go there continue to start continue to stop and it's all based on bondage it's all based on self-made prisons <laughs> because the gospel means good news for for a reason when you hear the gospel in its most authentic form as an unbeliever um it's you're gonna get angry about it <laughs> the reason why is because it's not fair when you hear the gospel in its most authentic form as a believer and you don't understand the new covenant you're gonna get angry about it <laughs> because it's not fair freedom is not fair okay it, according to the gospel everything is based on freedom that's what you ultimately have to deal with. So if you are not being accused <laughs> on a regular basis, if you're talking about this new covenant, you know, living it out, expressing it, if, if somebody is not saying something that contradicts freedom, it's because you're either not expressing that freedom authentically or you're not talking about it or you're not talking about it authentically. Hopefully I don't have too bad of connection problems. Again, I'm out here in my neighborhood getting my exercise in and sometimes I go down in these little dips and I know I'm gonna lose cellular connection. Sometimes it's worse than others. We'll see how it does today. But let's go over three facts about our Christian freedom today. And I hope this helps you understand your freedom. <laughs> Freedom's scary, it's so scary. And the freedom that comes through Christ is based on grace, which makes it even more scary. Because then you see things that happen from other people and you know that they are still free. <laughs> or you see things happen from 
unbelievers and that they could have the opportunity to be free by grace through faith. You begin to apply the freedom that you have in full to others, both the unbelieving crowd and the believing crowd. All right. Jesus said, you're really only a slave if you're a slave of sin. Okay. Christians are not slaves to sin. Okay. We're going to get to that today, but let's go over the three facts about our Christian freedom today. And, um, these are going to be somewhat rapid fire because this could be a five hour long walk talk, but I'm going to try to condense each of these. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you what they are in the beginning. And then as we go along, I'm going to dive deep into each one. Number one, you are free from the Mosaic law. Okay. That's the first one. Number two, you are free from the power of sin. Okay. And then number three, you are free to do what you want. <laughs> Difficult even to hear all three of those. I'm sure for some of you, maybe for some of you, there's one or two of those. We're like, yeah, I definitely agree with that. But then the other one, I don't, or I, you know, however you want to combine it, you're free. <laughs> okay. So let's go ahead and start with the first one about the three facts of our Christian freedom three facts about our Christian freedom. Number one, you are free from the Mosaic law. Now, if you don't know what the Mosaic law is, if this is news to you, the Mosaic law is the old covenant. What's the old covenant? When we look at scripture, something happened when Moses freed the people from slavery in Egypt, this people group, those were the Jews, also known as the Hebrew people, also known as the Israelites, also known as Israel, okay? So it is a lineage, a physical DNA of a certain group of people. Just like, you know, um, you have American Indians, you have Incas, you've got all these different lineages. There was also the Jews, okay? So when the Jews were freed from slavery in Egypt, Moses... You know, he said, let my people go. You know, he did. Pharaoh eventually did let them go because of the plagues and everything else that was being brought on. When they got out into the wilderness, some of them wanted to go back into slavery in Egypt because it was easier there. They didn't know how to handle their freedom. It's the same thing that happens after you become a Christian. We want to put ourselves back under things that were never meant to be, that we were never meant to be put under to begin with. But this started out with the Israelites. So when they were free, they wanted structure set up. So God put the law into place. It was called the Mosaic law because it was put in place by Moses. So when you look at the Bible and you see the word law, okay, 99.9% .9 of the times it is referring to the law of Moses. Okay. Now there's another law. Uh, two other different types of laws listed in scripture. Those have nothing to do with today's walk talk. Um, those are not the law. That is not the law of Moses. Okay. Now the law of Moses is 613 commandments. Our modern church teaches the kids in the, in the Sunday school, teaches everybody in the Sunday school, children's church, that there's only 10 to follow. That right there is error because Deuteronomy chapter four says, do not add to the law. Do not take away from the law. The law is 613 commandments, not just 10. Okay. <laughs> not just 10. If you want to follow the law, there's some stipulations. Number one, you have to keep all of it. Paul told the Galatians, you are cursed if you don't continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Why did he say that? Because he formally followed the law perfectly. And this group in Galatia had Judaizers who were the Jewish people who still wanted to follow the law, follow Paul into Galatia and begin to push law in with the gospel. This is why Paul also said in Galatians chapter five, it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. What's the yoke of slavery? The law, 613 commandments. Okay. 
They wanted their ears tickled. That is the itching ears context is law observance. It's not the prosperity gospel, as so many people want to say. It's actually Judaism. It's more stuff to do. It's more stuff to stop. It's more stuff to start. It's 613 commandments. So you are free 100% from the Mosaic law. First of all, the stipulations to follow the law, you had to be Jewish. So if you're not Jewish in your physical lineage, you were not even allowed to read it. You're a Gentile. Gentiles, Paul told the Ephesians, were without hope in regard to the covenant. Ephesians chapter 2. So you don't even have the option to read the law. You're considered a pig to them, a dog, a sinner. You're not one of them. So you were never under the Mosaic law. You never had the law. (laughs) So you're free from it. So if you are attempting to put yourself under any of the 613, including the Ten Commandments, yes, you don't get to cherry pick that. (laughs) You're putting yourself back under somebody else's legislation that's not yours to begin with. Okay, so you're free from the law. Okay. Paul told the Romans... Romans chapter six, sin will no longer be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. Four chapters later, he said, Christ is the end of the law for everyone who will believe. Now, it's the end of the law for the Jews. So the Jews who was put under that set of commandments at Mount Sinai, when it was put in place by Moses, they said, we will do everything written in the book of the law. They didn't say, we'll just do 10. They said everything. Before the ink had dried, so to speak, they were already breaking the first commandment. Don't have any other gods before me. And they were, they made a golden idol. So from the beginning, the Mosaic law was flawed Not the actual law, not the actual commandments, not the actual covenant. But the author of Hebrews tells us it was the the Jews' inability to live up to their end of the bargain. They could never do it. So it was flawed from the beginning and it was fading. There is a better ministry for morality. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, it is the ministry of the Spirit So when you first hear this and you're like, well, I got to have the Ten Commandments so I don't uh, lie, cheat, steal, commit adultery. It didn't stop the Jews from doing that. In fact, it increased those actions. Romans chapter 5 tells us that. The law was brought in so that sin would increase. Romans chapter 7, Paul expresses his former life as a devout Jew attempting to follow the law. And in Romans 7, he's actually talking about one of the Ten Commandments. Don't be jealous. So you have to die to the law. You have to understand the law is dead for everyone who will believe. You have to understand it has been nailed to the cross with its requirements. Paul told the Colossians that. So you are free from the law. You don't need the Ten Commandments. You... The Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ within you will never guide you into immorality. You don't need the Ten Commandments to tell you that. Yeah, but we need parts of it. You need none of it. You have to die to all of it. All of the law. That's why Paul said, you're cursed if you don't do everything in the law. If you don't continue to do. This is why James said in James chapter 2, if you break one commandment, you break them all. Now, when you break a commandment, what must happen according to the law? Blood must be shed because that is a transgression of the law. You would be considered somebody who is a worker of lawlessness. Those listed in Matthew chapter seven, these people who were saying, did we not cast out demons? Did we not prophesy? Did we not perform miracles? What did Jesus said? Not in my name, you didn't. I never knew you. Why? Because you never did the will of the father. What's the will of the father? Is the will of the father to cast out demons, prophesy and perform miracles? No. Jesus tells us in John chapter six, that the will of the father is to believe in the one whom he has sent. They never did that. Okay. So workers of law is unbelievers. You are not a worker of the law. You are not under the law. And if you're Jewish, perhaps you're watching this and you're Jewish and you're like, yes, I'm Jewish. I can follow the law. I'm sorry, but (laughs) 
There is no sacrifice left for you either. Only a fearful expectation of fire and judgment because you would be trampling on the spirit of grace. You would be deliberately sinning according to the law of Moses and there's no way to be forgiven at the temple. We see this in Hebrews chapter 10. You know, Hebrews 10, 26, a lot of people want to go to that and say, if you deliberately keep on sinning and they want to say those are deliberate sins, those are willing sins. Every sin is deliberate. Every sin is willing. We are not robots. The deliberate sins in Hebrews chapter 10 is referring to deliberate sins of one of the 613. They were continuing to break all of these commandments deliberately, knowing full well all they had to do was go to the temple at the next day of atonement, hand off their animal. They would be forgiven for their past year of sinning. They would go on their way. They would not believe that Jesus was the last once for all sacrifice for sins. They would not believe it. This is not a Christian. Christians aren't being forgiven that way. The entire book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews, the Jews, Israel. And this author was so scared about these things that they were saying, they didn't even sign the letter to the Hebrews because they knew this is blasphemy. Everything that they were saying, they were saying Christ is greater than Moses, Christ is greater than the angels, Christ is greater than the Levites, Christ is greater than everything. He's greater than your annual bloody atonement day at the temple because the Jews only received forgiveness once a year through animal blood. That's why Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Christ comes along, sheds his blood one time. So now they have to repent from that bloody sacrifice system toward the belief in Christ. So they're not even under the Mosaic law. You're not under the Mosaic law. There is no temple. There's no way to be forgiven. Okay, <laughs> you gotta repent from that. Okay, so... The first fact about your Christian freedom is you are free from the Mosaic law. All of it. You have the Holy Spirit in you. He'll never leave you because the only thing that could cause him to leave would be sins. But at the cross, he dealt with all of your sins once and for all time. That's why Hebrews chapter 8 says he remembers your sins no more. So he chooses not to remember your sins because you've trusted him by grace. You know, the book of Hebrews says it was God's pleasure that Christ would taste death, death for you. <laughs> that sounds kind of, you know, demented, but death had to be fulfilled because of sin. Christ did that. He offered his blood one time in the real temple in heaven. We see in Hebrews chapter nine. And after that, he sat down after providing purifications for sins. Hebrews chapter one tells us the sin issue between God and man is over. Is everybody forgiven? No, the offer is on the table. We are ambassadors for Christ. We are saying God has reconciled himself to you. Be reconciled back. How? Believe Jesus by grace, by no work of your own. Don't believe Jesus plus the law because then you'd be putting yourself back under a yoke of slavery. Don't believe Jesus plus your effort because you're putting yourself back under a, a, a yoke of slavery. Don't believe Jesus plus your dedication, your commitment. That's a joke. Your dedication, your commitment is an absolute joke compared to the Jews. You don't even want to go there. <laughs> you might think you have really good dedication. You might think you're really committed. Yee! Nope. Your job as somebody on this side of the cross is to trust Jesus. This is why Paul told, well, I don't know if it was Paul. I think it was Paul. This is why the author of Hebrews said, make every effort to enter rest. Hebrews 4.11. This was a paramount passage for me in finally understanding the new covenant. Make every effort to enter rest. Now in context, the author is letting these Hebrew people know that your Jewish unbelieving ancestors would not do this. You need to do this now. They wouldn't go into the promised land because they wouldn't believe God that they'd be safe and secure. They were scared. 40 years they wandered around in the wilderness and all they had to do was believe God. And they wouldn't do it. That's what we have to do on this side of the cross. <laughs> Unfortunately, you have to work really hard at only believing God. You believe him about Jesus. You know, and the legalist will immediately pull out even the demons believe. Don't worry about that passage. That passage is not comparing your faith to a demon. 
Demons don't have the opportunity to be saved. You do. There's no fly in the ointment. Every single Bible verse you can possibly think about, go to my website, search it, I've written about it. Or go to my YouTube channel, search it, I've talked about it. Or I'm working on building these up so you can always be confident in what Christ has done. I'm always gonna go back to what Jesus has done. The only thing that could possibly cause any issue between you and God is sins. And what Jesus did was sufficient. Even if you sinned, Every second of every day until you died, that's still not more powerful than what Christ did. From this notion, <laughs> you'll live authentically. And that's going to be number three on this list. So let's go ahead and get on to number two. You are free from the power of sin. Now, when I say you're free from the power of sin, the first thing you might think of is sinning. The verbs of sinning. Okay, you know, some of our modern church will say, you know, uh, drinking, smoking, cussing, going to the club, you know, whatever you have in mind. Hi, Kayla. Hey, how are you? Good, you? Good. It's busy out here today. Got traffic and a lot of people walking, so I got to be super careful here. All right, let me get back over here. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, so you are free from the power of sin. This is number two of three facts about, about your Christian freedom. Our Christian freedom is number one was you're free from the Mosaic law. Number two, you are free from the power of sin. Now, when I say you're free from sin, the charismatic group, and I'm not against charismatic people. I, I'm charismatic. <laughs> Have you seen my walk talks? But what we're charismatic about needs to be charismatic about truth. So the people who are in the charismatic group who do not understand the difference in the old new covenant when they say i'm free from the i'm free from sin god set me free from sin they think about behavior he set me free from sin it's the first thing they go to i did this he set me free from my drinking he set me free from my porn watching he set me free from fill in the blank whatever it was I'm free. You're free from the power of sin. This is not the verbs of sinning. <laughs> he didn't die to set you free from that. Because you're still going to sin. Now, when you first hear that, you're like, oh, well, where are we going with this? Because you've been taught behavior <laughs> for so long. Rather than identity. I'm going to help you shift your focus away from the behavior Get your identity right. Because when you get your identity right, your behavior will begin to match up with that a lot more often than not because you're not confusing your identity with behavior. Okay, so Jesus did not die to set you free from drinking, smoking, cussing, legalism, whatever. The behaviors. Those behaviors are still going to happen, but you're still free. And the more you know that you're free, the less those behaviors will happen. Okay, so when we see that you're set free from sin, he said this to, or when, he, when Jesus said, you're really only a slave when you're a slave to sin. Who did he say this to? The Jews. <laughs> they were the most well-behaved people on the planet. 613 different ways to obey. 613 different ways to express righteous behavior. So why would he tell them you're really only a slave if you're a slave to sin, if their behavior was really good? Because they were still slaves to the power of sin, the force, not the verbs of sinning. So when we look at the book of Genesis, there is a force that entered this realm when Adam and Eve no longer believed God. It is called sin. The Greek word is hamartia. It is a force like gravity. It's, and if it infects everything physical. I'm infected with it. It is in me, but it is not me. It's like a tumor. Everybody, everything, everything physical is infected with the power of sin because of what Adam and Eve did. That power wasn't here until Adam and Eve no longer believed God. That was the first sin. I don't believe God. 
I need to do something. I need to have knowledge of good and evil so that I can be more like God. That was Satan's first temptation and it continues on this side of the cross. So when somebody tells you you're not completely forgiven, you need to stop that sin so that you'll be more like God. That's the same temptation Adam and Eve went through. You're already like God. So because you're already like God, because you've trusted in Jesus, because your old self died, because you've been crucified on the cross with Jesus, because you've been buried in the tomb with Jesus, baptized supernaturally into him, not talking about water, you don't want to sin. (laughs) But you will because you're still here, because the power of sin is still here, and because God is allowing this for now. Okay, so... You are free from the power of sin, hamartia. Only Christ can do this by grace through faith in him. You are taken, we see this in Romans chapter 6, where you are taken out of the power of sin, placed into the spirit of Jesus. But this only happens after you believe in Jesus by grace. And it happens one time. Now, when we look at Genesis chapter four, we see sin crouching at your door is is the words, so to speak. It desires to have you. We can see that sin is an it. Sin is an it. You are free from it. (laughs) Okay. So everything about you in regard to the power of sin, you have been set free from. We see this in um, Romans chapter 6 in great detail. Paul uh, talks about being um, your old self died, buried in the tomb of Jesus, resurrected and fully united and connected with Jesus. Okay, and you're taken out of the power of sin. You have literally supernaturally died to the power of sin. Okay, and now you are a brand new, perfect, holy creation. It its passions, its desire. We're going to get to that. That's the flesh. But the power of sin, you have died to. Okay? You are free from the power of sin. So, the power of sin can still influence you, but you get to make a decision. Whereas you were a slave to sin before salvation, now you are a slave to righteousness. Paul tells us that in the book of Romans. So you are a slave to righteousness. You used to be a slave to sin, but now you are a slave to righteousness. That means you you can't get away from it. That is who you are. You know, a lot of people, they don't understand this and they'll say there's not one righteous. That's an unbeliever. So we have to stop applying unbelievers passages to ourselves. You are righteous. (laughs) You're actually a slave to righteousness and you can't get away from it. So you might as well express your righteousness, express the fruit of the spirit, be yourself. You know, this is so difficult to understand. Some people will say, yes, you're only righteous, but in Christ, as if like it's separate. You're always in Christ. You're always one spirit with him. This is not separate. But people, when they first hear this, that I'm just as righteous as God, I'm just as righteous as Jesus. It's hard to understand, but we didn't do this. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says he became sin so we can become righteous. It was a divine trade-off. So we got to get away from thinking our behavior causes us to be righteous. (laughs) Our behavior causes us to be unrighteous. It doesn't. Understand your identity is what makes you righteous. You're either 100% righteous or 100% not righteous based on what you've believed about Jesus. Okay, so that's number two in regard to your Christian freedom. Number one was you're free. You're completely free from the Mosaic law. Number two, you're completely free from the power of sin. Number three, you are free to do whatever you want. (laughs) I'm going to repeat that (laughs) really close to the camera here. You are free to do what you want. (laughs) This is one of the number one attacks we get in the new covenant community. We're just telling people they can do whatever they want. Why do they say that? (laughs) Why do they think we shouldn't be doing what we want? (laughs) Because they don't know what they want. Because they are always told the opposite of what they want. And then they're told, don't want that. 
they're they're described as a sinner when they're not a sinner they're a saint a sinner is what you were paul called himself the chief of sinners when he was described in his past life as a devout pharisee why would he call himself a sinner if he was super obedient to the law because he didn't believe because he was still in the power of sin so we are we are told so many different errors about who we are and then we are told but you you need to live the opposite okay you you really want to sin you really want to do that you really want to insert bad thing but don't do it deny yourself Okay, and then they'll go back to the Gospels. <laughs> they'll take a passage where Jesus is telling them something that they can't possibly do. And then they'll apply it to themselves. And they'll say, see, deny yourself. Did any of the disciples deny themselves to the point of following Jesus to Calvary? No, none of them. They all scattered. John was there. Okay, everybody else was, they gone. So they didn't deny themselves. Matter of fact, the supposed air quote rock I'm not even going down there today, but they didn't deny themselves. You don't have to deny yourself. You need to be yourself. You denied yourself when you believed by grace through faith. That was when you denied yourself. And then at that moment, you became saved. You got a new self. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter six, our old self died. So you can do what you want. You know, Peter in... Let's see, I think it's 2 Peter 1. He starts out telling them, or maybe it's 1 Peter 1, either way. He starts out telling them about their divine nature. He's writing this letter and he says, you guys are now partakers in the divine nature. And then after telling them about their new nature, they don't have a sinful nature, I'm gonna get to that. After telling them about their new nature, you have God's divine nature. He lists all these things, goodness, unity, knowledge about Jesus, loving one another. He lists all these good things. And he said, if you lack any of these qualities, it's going to prevent you from being productive. I say the same thing. The qualities are not being expressed because you forget that you actually want what God wants. And you will figure that out one way or the other. You're either going to Walk according to something that you're not, and you're not going to be fulfilled, or you are going to do what you want, which is to build bridges, love others, be faithful. <laughs> Everything that has to do with the fruit of the Spirit. That's how you know. If those things are being expressed through your actions and attitudes, you are doing what you want. But when you deny forgiveness, when you gossip, when you attack, when you find excuses to not be patient, when you find reasonings to not even be patient with yourself, when you find reasons to continue to allow yourself to be abused, you're not doing what you want. You should always do what you want. And you know, Peter says, if you lack these qualities, you have forgotten your cleansing, as in you've forgotten who you are. You want what God wants and you're going to prove it. You don't need to say, you can't just do whatever you want. You know, the unbelievers, they, oh, they attack me so much with this. <laughs> Anytime I, <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but it's funny because they don't believe in God, but yet they tell me I shouldn't do what I want. Oh, you're just saying you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I actually am. Oh yeah, very convenient for you. <laughs> and I get it from the believing community too, or those who claim to be believers are like, you can't just do whatever you want. You gotta, and then they'll take a passage out of context. It's because we're not taught that we want what God wants. We're not taught that we, we are not taught that we are brand new creations with God's divine nature. Okay. In regard to nature, you know, there, some people will say you have two natures, so you should not do what your bad nature wants to do. You don't have a bad nature. You have one nature. You have God's divine nature. So there was a translation of the Bible where the words, the flesh was changed to sinful nature. The problem with that is the original Greek word for the flesh, not just flesh, not our flesh, not your flesh, but that T-H-E in front of flesh changes the meaning completely. So when you see that T-H-E in front of the word flesh, the Greek word is sarx, S-A-R-X, and it is never describing your physical body. 
That should, that should solve so many problems for you. Now I'm going to get to that, but first of all, let's go back to sinful nature. Now this connotation of sinful nature, the NIV translation, I think it was the 84, the 1984 translation. This was the most sold Bible out there. And when they made this translation and they changed the flesh to sinful nature, every time people read sinful nature, they thought they were, they thought the Bible was talking about them, us, me, my nature. The problem with that is the flesh does not mean sinful nature. It does not mean me. It does not mean flesh. It does not mean my body. The flesh is a separate entity altogether. Sarks does not mean a human's physical body. So they changed it back after much advice from a lot of scholars. The NIV changed the word sinful nature back to the flesh. But we have all these people now who have that older translation of the NIV and it, they still read it every day and they read the word sinful nature as in themselves. But when you see the words, the flesh, that is the authentic translation. Also, the flesh is not you. If there's one thing you ever can remember about the words, the flesh, it is not your physical body. It is a separate entity. It's not you. You know, I personally, I say it is the power of sin, hamartia, being expressed through our actions and attitudes. We can even have it in our brain. Therefore, because we're physical, therefore having sinful thoughts. You know, you ever been just driving down the road and you have this egregious sinful thought? You're like, where did that come from? That's the flesh. It's not you. It's a separate entity altogether. This is why Paul said in the book of Romans, you have been taken out of the realm of the flesh, placed into the spirit of Jesus Christ, he said. You are not the flesh. You are not in the realm of the flesh. <laughs> you don't even have to fight the flesh. You are never instructed to deny the flesh or your flesh. That's error. <laughs> so we see in Galatians 5 chapter Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 and 17. We see walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now that we know that the flesh is not us, that it's sarks, we can see that walking by the spirit is what you want. You don't want to walk according to the flesh. Can you walk that way? Yes, but it is not natural for you. It is like an eagle walking down here on the ground like a yard bird or a turkey. Can that eagle do that? Yes, but it would be walking according to a turkey. So when we walk according to the flesh, that's not what we really want. We want to walk according to the spirit. Now, if we keep reading Galatians 5:17, it says, the spirit is at battle with the flesh. The flesh is at battle with the spirit. Where are you? You don't do anything. But when you attempt to get into that fight, you don't do what you want. The spirit desires was contrary to the flesh. The flesh desires was contrary to the spirit. Them two. That's not you. That's not your body. But when you attempt to get into that fight, when you're like, I'm going to fight the flesh today. I'm just going to, I'm going to wake up every day. I'm going to just like, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to fight the flesh then you're going to not do what you want. But when you rest, <laughs> when you trust the vine, when you simply abide, abide means live, then keep going down. Galatians 5, 22, 23. What's it say? <laughs> Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all these things will be expressed through your actions and attitudes because that's what you want because you're not fighting the flesh. You're not fighting your flesh. And it even says against such things, there is no law. So you can see that when you attempt to obey the law, the, Mo the Mosaic law, you're not going to produce the fruit of the spirit or bear the fruit of the spirit. You know, so many of us go to Galatians chapter five, and this is just 
one of the most ripped out of context passages in the entire Bible. Because we look at the word, the flesh, as our physical body, and it's never described in our physical body. It's describing the flesh. And then <laughs> all of these egregious things are happening because we're doing something debaucherous. But this is, this is all being caused from law observance. This is all being caused when you attempt to mix in the law of Moses with the gospel. That's why he starts out with the chapter. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't let yourself be yoked again to the bondage of slavery. What's the bondage of slavery? You foolish Galatians, you're attempting to circumcise yourself. Circumcision is part of the law. That is of no value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. But you're going back to the law. Stop listening to these Judaizers. You're being fools. If you continue in this, <laughs> you are walking according to the flesh. Don't do that. Walk according to the spirit. Because if you attempt to put in effort, you are putting in fleshly effort. You will not be doing what you want. Against such things, there is no law. The only law we have is to owe nobody no, nothing and to bear the burdens of one another. We see that in the very next chapter. You're not under the law. <laughs> You're free from the power of sin. You're free from the flesh. The flesh is not you. <laughs> and you should always do what you want. Always do what you want. You're, you're, you're going to do what you want. So I hope that makes sense to you guys. All right. <laughs> so super freaking hot out here today, guys. I don't know if you're listening on the podcast. I am drenched in sweat. And but I've enjoyed this walk talk. Today is July 4th, 2022. Normally don't put dates on my walk talk, but the title of this walk talk is three three facts about our Christian freedom. And I wanted, I wanted to talk about our freedom today. So I hope that's, hope that's encouraged you guys today. Let's re recap three facts about our Christian freedom. Number one, you are free from the Mosaic law. Number two, you are free from the power of sin. Number three, you are free to do what you want. Do what you want. Always do what you want. Oh, okay, guys. All right. So I'm not going to recap everything about everything, but I hope this has encouraged you today. I uh, hope it's brought to light. You know, one other thing about the, the flesh real quick. You know, so many people, they're just at battle with their flesh. And for some reason, I just want to talk about this just a couple more minutes about the flesh. If we could understand that Paul told the Colossians, self-abasement is of no value. What does that mean? You doing harsh treatment to your body in order to prove your holiness, there's no value there. We can begin to understand that our bodies are instruments of righteousness. He told the Romans that. He told the Ephesians, you care for your body like Christ cares for the church. There's nothing wrong with your flesh. Your flesh is is a beautiful instrument. It is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Why would you want to crucify the temple of the Holy Spirit? Live, <laughs> mature, grow. Uh, you know, when Paul said, I die daily, he was not talking about harming his flesh. He was talking about the physical dangers he faced as he traveled to preach the gospel. Read the whole chapter, <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15. He even says, I fought wild dogs. There's not a single Bible verse that says you have to do anything harmful to your flesh. Your flesh has normal human desires. There's nothing wrong with the actual desires. The Holy Spirit will guide you with those desires and help you to express them properly. But you're still holy. Paul told the Thessalonians, all three parts of you are blameless. Spirit soul, body. <laughs> you are a spirit, holy, who has a soul, your mind, free will, and emotions. The Greek word for soul is suke. You live in a temporary body. You're going to get a new body. Don't be hard on your flesh, please. Be kind to your flesh. <laughs> the enemy wants you to think something's wrong with your flesh. The enemy wants you to deny your flesh. There's nothing wrong with your flesh. 
listen to your flesh's desires and then walk according to the spirit. It's really that simple. Okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your body. I don't know where that came from, but I do want to throw that back in. So, all right. So <laughs> always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. You're a new creation. You're not under the Mosaic law. You're free from the power of sin and you should always do what you want. <laughs> so always tell the truth about yourself and always be yourself. Love y'all. Bye.